Hi there, and welcome to Draw With Me. I'm Danny Gregory, and uh, <clears throat> I'm having one of those mornings. I had this whole idea for a project, I started working on it, and I managed to screw it up. I managed to get paint on my hands. I managed to get um, a paper cut, like two seconds ago as I was opening a pad of Bristol. But I'm glad to be here. Maybe you're having that kind of a day, too. <laughs> Lenore asked if I had a good night's sleep. And you know what? I actually did have a very good night's sleep after staying up for an entire night to work on um, volunteering for people getting vaccines at the stadium here in, in Phoenix. So we were up all day. We stayed up all night. We got home. We had like an hour of sleep. But then last night slept really well. It's great to have been part of that whole thing. It was very interesting. And uh, it was it was a good experience. So, But today I'm obviously a little... Blah, 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 blah. But anyway, let's start by talking about those hearts. Seriously, people, you did an amazing job drawing that heart. I mean, I feel like every week when we show the um, art you made the week before at the beginning of the, this program. It gets more and more interesting, more, better, more individual. That's what I really like to see. Not that we're all doing the same thing and it all looks the same, but that you all are expressing yourselves and putting yourselves into it. So that is beautiful, beautiful to see. And it was particularly in evidence, I thought, when you drew those hearts, you really made them yourselves. So that was really nice. <sighs> okay, so now that I have the paint and the blood <laughs> under control. Let's move on. Let's talk about some other stuff. Ah, okay. Um, here's something that I'm kind of excited about. Whoops. And it's not disappearing. It's art for all. So this is a podcast that I put a fair amount of uh, energy into and then kind of burnt out about two years ago. So I did this podcast it was pretty cool. It was fun. It talked to a lot of interesting people about art. And now I've decided to rethink it and to do a version of it that fits more with what my priorities are now, what I think you'd like to hear. And so I've relaunched Art before, Art for All. Um, and uh, the first episode came out this week. And my plan is, my ambition is to do a new episode of this podcast every week. Um, and just to, just to kind of talk about stuff that uh, I think will be helpful to you as you're creating. So yeah, so there it is, bit.ly slash SBS podcast takes you to the main page. You don't really need that URL. You just need to go to what, however you listen to podcasts on your iPhone, let's say. Just, you know, where you search for podcasts, type in Art for All, it'll come up. It's... Uh, it's fun to do. I'm trying to make these uh, episodes a little bit more to the point, a little shorter, a little less fancy, so that I can make them every week. Um, the ones I was making before was kind of like making like a, a movie or something, the amount of effort that I had to put into it to make it kind of polished and nice. That's an, that is a, a battle that I fight. Maybe you fight it too between, well, perfectionism. Perfectionism is all around us. Perfectionism is the the uh, COVID-19 of creativity. Always lurking, always looking for a way to get a grip on us. A lot of times perfectionism means that you just keep polishing and tweaking the stuff that in the end probably doesn't really matter that much and most people won't really notice. Might be good, but I think the problem with that is it gets in the way of you actually moving on and learning and growing because you're finagling. I think even worse, perfectionism stops you from doing stuff in the first place because you go, oh, it'll probably never be that good, shouldn't even bother to start. So you got to get your perfectionism under control. It is not helping you. It is not making things perfect, in part because perfection is 
an illusion that doesn't actually exist. We're human beings. We're animals who, you know, fart and, and belch and are, you know, have hair growing in the wrong places. We're not perfect. And you're not going to make anything that's perfect. And who cares? Who wants to see computers make perfect stuff, all right? It, that, we, we don't need humans to make that, to make perfection. So just get it out of your mind. Get it out of your life. It's not helping you. Perfectionism sucks. It's imperfect. All right, so it, so anyway, so because of this kind of need I had to do the level of production that um, was the goal when I was doing advertising, because in advertising you have it has to be perfect. You can't put a TV commercial on the air and then like have something misspelled or have something wonky or have something you know cut out. The music cuts out in the middle. Those kinds of things. Things you can sort of get away with a podcast, although they're annoying. But when it comes to like the level of finesse that you have to do when, when you make a TV commercial, I was applying that level to doing stuff by myself. Stuff that I used to have a whole team of people to work with and, and experts and, and polish people who really, um, you know, really, this is their job. And... You know, you would spend months and months making a 30-second commercial. I didn't want to spend months and months making a podcast anymore. I don't have months and months to do that kind of stuff. So I wanted to just get it out there to you. So anyway, so this imperfect podcast has relaunched. It's out there. You know, it'll take five minutes of your life. It might be worth that. Okay. But moving on to people who have more of a grip on perfection. I also want to tell you about, my God. I want to tell you about Paint a Pub. Paint a Pub is our new workshop. This is a really fun workshop. It is taught by Ian Fenley, who has taught two pod, two workshops for us before that were both incredibly popular and incredibly successful at getting people to, um, to make beautiful art. But this one is different because, A, you're going to paint a British pub which is nice. I'd like to go to a bridge, but I'd like to go to a bar soon, soon. But Ian takes us to a pub and teaches us the essence of urban sketching. Urban sketching is probably something you've heard about. Urban sketching is something maybe you've done. But Ian is one of the best urban sketchers there is. And he's going to teach you how to do it, how to think about it, how to sit down and draw a building and think about how to compose it, how to deal with perspective, how to deal with light and shadow, texture, how to make a statement that tells a story. A lot of urban sketching is flat and dull. Again, attempting to be perfect. It ends up looking like an architectural plan. Honestly, how often do you go to a museum and see an architectural plan hanging on the wall? They're boring. They're dull. They are not what you want to be making as an artist. So. Um, and Ian is, while I think in many ways is, is a perfect urban sketcher, he's not a perfectionist. He is a storyteller, and that is his goal, is to imbue his art with feeling and emotion, which is what I think we should all be trying to do. So um, I'm really excited that he's going to be teaching this kind of fundamentals workshop. He's never done that for us before. The first one he did was called Paint the Town Gray, which is about really how you represent tone and value in shades of gray. The second one he did was um, about painting your house and really injecting emotion into a portrait of your own home. But this one is about learning fundamentals that you will apply for years to come. So as soon as the vaccines are in place and we're all free to go and wander the streets and sit around drawing the pubs and all kinds of stuff, you will be f fully equipped thanks to this workshop. Let me just show it to you. Hi everybody, I'm Ian Fennelly and I'm putting together for you a workshop with Sketchbook School and I'm really excited to be drawing the harp in which is this beautiful old English pub. I'm going to break it down for you into lots and lots and lots of steps. It's a great opportunity for those of you out there that haven't done a huge amount of urban sketching before. You know, you can push yourself as far as you want. So urban sketching guys, it's so good, it's so cool. It's a really inspiring and satisfying experience to have the whole world as your subject. It's just a great, great, great fun to do.
Okay, so go to our webpage. You know where it is, sketchbooktool.com. Go there, check it out, sign up. You've got a couple weeks to do it in. And I'll be telling you more about it as time goes by once I stop bleeding intensely. <laughs> Honestly, this is really annoying. Paper cuts are the worst. But that's what happens when you deal with paper. Should have stuck to my iPad. Never had an iPad cut. No. All right. Let's move on. Let's move on to, to drawing, to today's project. So one, a thing that I was thinking about is cars. Oh, no, you're groaning. Cars. I hate cars. I'm not, I'm not interested in cars. Or maybe you are interested in cars. And maybe you're not interested in learning to draw them, possibly. Um, but what today we're going to do is we're going to draw cars, but it's going to be different. It's not going to be, you're not going to have to worry about it. You're not going to have to worry about, oh, I don't know how to draw a car. Because you do. You drew cars when you were six. Um, so that's what we're going to do is we're going to draw cars. But I've labeled today's program um, autobiography. And what I mean by that is our lives are um, defined, not defined, but, but um, how, how do I say this? That we, we get, are measured out, perhaps, in the cars that we've owned. They might be measured out in other things, too. They might be measured out in the dogs or the cats that you've had in your entire life. And maybe we'll do that one day. They may, be, they may be measured out in the relationships that you've had. Maybe, maybe you've been married multiple times, you know. I mean, we'll sit, we could sit down with Elizabeth Taylor, can we? Is she still alive? No. But we could sit down with somebody who has uh, had many marriages, perhaps, and sp do drawings of all of the spouses if you wanted to. Well, maybe we'll save that one for later. But uh, for now, I'm thinking, what are the cars that you owned? The ones that were that had some story attached to them, you know, the ones that said, "Oh yeah, that was the time when we had that car." You with me? Okay. Um, so yes, so let's think about your autos and your cars. I don't see a lot of enormous enthusiasm going on in the commentary, so uh, yeah, that might mean. Um, there's a lack of enthusiasm. Well, get over it, people. Get crazy. Get, get interested. Get out your pens. And if, you've, if, like Biz, you've only owned one car, I'm going to point out to you that that's probably not the case, that there have been other cars in your life. And these various cars are going to be the stories, the chapters that we tell. Good Lord. Okay. What is going on here? Excuse me while I try and... Uh, interesting. Sorry. Look at this extreme close-up of my reddened eyes um, as I switch to my other camera. Okay. So, let me get these cables out of the way. Let me get this guy in place. And let's, let's look at a piece of paper here, and let's think about what was the very first car that you, can, that you have memory of. So in my case, um, my mother had bought a car when she was really young. My mother was really young when I was born. I was really young when I was born, too, but so was my mother. Uh, my mother was, I think she was 20. I forget exactly, 20, 21. She was pretty young. And... Um, she was a student. My parents uh, met in when they were both at University of London. Or was it London University? I don't know. Whatever. It was one of those. It was a university in London where they were both psychology students. And, um, you know, being students, they didn't have a lot of money. So um, my mother had bought this car. I don't know what kind of car it was. I... I haven't talked to her about it for years. It was maybe a Rover or a, a Morris, one of those very English cars, you know, kind of. 
and it was um, it was sort of roundish, as those kind of cars will be, um, and you know. So again, I'm going to just draw this car sort of from what I think it looked like. You know, imagine it had a small boot, as they say. Um, I think it probably had biggish fenders or mud guards, and I think it probably had a running board. You know, then it had a back sort of um, thing like that. Another mud guard, fender, and um, something like that. What I think was interesting about this car, the thing that I remember my mother talking about, was that, and I mean, this was, so, I mean, I'm, I'm old, but I'm not that old, but this car had a crank. Yes, children, there was a time when that's how you started a car. You cranked it up, and that's what began it. I mean, that's what started. I don't know, again, what period that was at those, but I do remember that she had that, and she would always complain about it, and she said this, this car was such a pain Picky on a cold day, you had to crank the damn thing up. So, I'm kind of thinking that it was like that, with a crank, and, uh, you know, it probably had like one of those little tiny mini hood, mini kind of visors that cars of the, this is, this car must have been, I mean, this car must have been 40s era, although, if you, any of you know more about cars than I do, um, you might be able to correct me and say there's no way that a car had a crank in the 40s, but maybe it did. What do you think? Okay? So, yeah. So that was, she would start that car up, and she bought it for a really ridiculously small amount of money. I mean, it was like a 10 pounds or something like that. It was it was really cheap, really, really cheap, and kind of an, an awful and annoying vehicle. Um, I imagine that it had like a, a door that you open from the front. I don't know if that was the case, but I kind of like to think that that was the, but that's what it was about. So yeah, so that was that car, bit of a bumper. All right, are you with me on this program? You see how this car drawing is, you know? Hey, what if it had something like that? You know, cars used to have that sometimes. They would have, didn't they have like the, a rear view mirror mounted on the fender? think so well my car did my version of this car I'm also thinking that maybe maybe it had little spokes so yeah so I don't have any personal memory of this car I do remember that there was one photograph which I couldn't find when I looked for it because I want to show it to you that um, had a picture of her like with one foot on the on the front bumper trying to crank the damn thing up so she must have been 20, 21 at age. So that was probably the first car that I ever kind of was in. All right? All right, Biz, see you later. Sorry you can't hang out with me and draw cars. I have a feeling a lot of you are going to say, you know what? I don't know what he's up to today. I'm not drawing cars with him. But that's cool. I'll do them alone. I'll draw by myself. Draw with just me. All right. Okay. Are getting really wonky. I need to go to an optometrist. Okay. The next car was belonged to my first stepfather. So this is after, not long after, but but after, and it was a, a Mustang. And it was um, it was a, a kind of Mustang that was pretty slick. It it was called a fastback. So this is uh, 1965 or 6. Mustang came out in 64 and a half. So this is um, kind of pretty early on. And this belonged to my first stepfather when we briefly lived in Pittsburgh. And uh, he had this white fastback. And it was like a very cool car at the time. Or he thought it was cool and he talked an awful lot about it. My first stepfather was from from Long Island, so he had uh, kind of grown up with cars, I imagine. And so this car had this fast back, which was like that, and it had, uh, let's see, it had, let's draw it like that. 
it had these sort of louvers that kind of went down that part, something like that. Then it had uh, classic sort of Mustang kind of little divot in the door like that. Kind of cool. And I think I've made the hood probably too long, but yeah, that's the basic idea. Very, very, I mean, quite a difference from that original car. Quite a difference. Okay, I'm, I'm glad to see you guys are kind of getting into it now. Good. Excellent. Because cars, you know, there's emotion attached to cars, right? Story. Things that happen to us. Things we remember that, were, that happened in a car. That's kind of what I'm getting at. Not the details and the... You know, is a car accurate, and did you draw the perspective right, and is the hood the right size? But no, more just like, as you draw it, think back. Think back at to the stories that you tell about it, or the stories you remember, or maybe the stories you don't remember, and as you're drawing, I promise you, these stories will start to flood back to you. Oh, yeah, that's right. My, this happened or that happened. My dad did this, or my mom did that, or I couldn't remember the smell of it. I can remember... God, one thing I always hated as a kid and kind of don't like it that much either now is when you get into a car and it's got like all kinds of stuff in it, um, detritus, you know. I saw a thing recently. Somebody had, I don't know, this is this is probably sexist, but this, um, it was it was a drawing of like a, a young guy's room, bedroom and a young guy's car, young guy, uh, young woman's bedroom, young woman's car. And the guy's bedroom was a complete mess. You know, unmade bed, piles of clothes everywhere, junk, you know, food wrappers, and, you know, all that kind of stuff all over the room. Inside of the car, pristine, perfect. The young girl's room, inside, perfect. Bed made, everything neat, everything clean, organized, clothes hung neatly. Inside the car, food wrappers, crumpled up bags, so forth. So, I don't know. Is that a stereotype? Maybe. How neat is your car? How neat is your car? There's a song for you. Jen. All right. So there you go. Um, what was the next car? Oh yes, okay. So when we lived in Australia, when I was, uh, that was the next place I lived, um, my mother, one day I was coming home from school and uh, suddenly this car drove towards me, beeping. I was like, well, I was eight, seven. This car is beeping at me. As it came, the sun was glinting on the windshield so I couldn't see who was in it. And as it came up, I realized it was my mother and my mother had bought herself an MGB. Okay, I don't know if you know what that is, but you're about to see what it looks like. It was very kind of roundish, and it was um, a convertible, kind of like that. It had this back, move this over here. It had, uh, it was a convertible with a kind of a cute kind of roundish nose and something like that. And then it had, uh, I think it had like wire wheels. And something roughly like that. And um, windshield, probably had like a little side kind of thing. Then it had the here, it was like where the convertible roof went. Yeah, it was cute. It was very cute. Now, was it the car that you would think a woman who had a seven year old and a baby would buy as her only car? A car that actually didn't have a back seat. It had two bucket seats, it had a little tiny, like, platform with carpet on it that sat right behind the seats which is kind of like where you would I don't know so that when your scarf or your sunglasses blew off they wouldn't go onto the road yeah but that was my mother's car so that was a car like you know and we would sit back there sometimes with the dog we had a dog as well yeah but that was the scene 
that was the scene of this car. Another memory I had is at this time, my mother's second marriage to my first stepfather, well, it was her, it was her only marriage to my second stepfather, thank God for that, was disintegrating. And I remember um, a pretty dramatic scene, again, when I was eight, of my stepfather having a colossal fight with my mother. And uh, they both came running out of the house. We lived on a small kind of, I guess, sort of suburban street in Australia, in Canberra. And my mother rushed out of the house, jumped into the car. My stepfather came running out after her, yelling and whatever. And he uh, proceeded to kick in this door, to kick it, and completely dented and just messed up this entire side of the car as she was driving off. It was like a scene from a movie. You know, and again, at this point, my stepfather was 26. He was Jack's age, and uh, yeah. So that was that. Was that another memory of that car? I don't know whatever happened to it. But um, then the next thing that happened was my mother um, got involved with another guy who ultimately became my second stepfather, and he drove. The classic 60s car, although the MG was pretty classic, which was uh, a VW Beetle. Right? You remember what a Beetle looks like? They're they're a little a little hard for me to remember exactly. Um, they're sort of they were interesting cars because they were in a lot of ways they were not modern looking. They didn't have any of the kind of angles of a car from like an American car had from the 60s, but they had these like, big fenders. They had a little tiny car, but it had it was all round and big fenders. It was, it was really a car from another era, and yet somehow a lot of kind of people from that period. It was, you know, it was a cool car. I don't need to tell you. You know as much about it as I do. But um, a little hard to, to remember exactly what the lines were like, but I know it had... Kind of a small back window because I was often in the back seat of that car because there wasn't a back seat here. Um, and that car, I was prone to car sickness, so I remember a lot about that being sick in this car, ingratiating myself further with my, with my stepfather. So, yeah, so that was it, was sort of like that. All right, the next car we owned was, uh, this is, okay, so now we were living in Israel. It was 1971. And in Israel, it's unusual for people to have cars. It was was basically a pretty poor country. It's It's not really anymore but it was pretty poor. And um, they were desperate to get immigrants to come there, you know, to get people to come and to kind of help to build the country. This is, this is again, 1970, uh, after the Six-Day War, which was the big war that happened in 1967, and then it was before the Yom Kippur War, which happened in 73. So that's the period in which I lived there as a kid. And um, so if you were a new immigrant, they gave you all kinds of kind of perks that they didn't give to the average Israeli. And one of them was that you could buy a car tax-free. And the reason that was a big deal was because um, they had huge import taxes on kind of everything there. So, because they were trying to raise money for the government to pay for all these wars, I guess. And uh, so, if you could get a car without paying taxes on it, that was like a really big deal. And so, my stepfather, because he was from Detroit, kind of had to have a car. And he bought this car that was a, a Saab station wagon. It was an odd-looking car, 
and it was kind of mm, mustardy colored. And yeah, that's what it was. And I remember many times being in this car, going on long road trips, longish. You can't drive that far in Israel, it's a pretty small country, but longish. And I would sit back here and I would throw up out this window down the side of this car. So whenever we got to where we were going, invariably this side of the car would be covered with vomit. Ah, childhood memories. All right, Christine, stop looking at photographs. Do you see me looking at photographs? Just draw it from, draw it right. It could just be a blob with four wheels. The point isn't to draw a perfect representation of the car. The point is to just draw, to think about the memories of it. What were the things that you, you know, that happened to you? The photo's not gonna tell you any of that. Stick with me, stick with me, please. Okay. So for the next basically 10 years of my life, didn't really have cars because I lived in New York City where you have subway cars and buses. So, and I didn't learn to drive at the normal time when people learn to drive, right? When you're, what is it, 16, 15, 16? I learned to drive when I was 25. So yeah, so that whole... and. When I was 24 or 5, I moved out of Manhattan to Jersey City at a time when Jersey City was not what it is now, Lenore. And uh, I got to get a car. And so I bought this car. Man, this car was awesome. Um, it was, I bought it used, of course. It was a 1965 Ford Fairlane 500. Really, really beautiful gold colored. Used to call it the color of money. It was around the time when that movie came out. Color of money. It was super long. It had this line down the side. This golden color, like bronze. God, that car. And uh, inside it was like this big metal dashboard. Did it have, it had, it had sort of perfunctory seat belts. Um, Cause nobody really cared. People were living fast and dying young. 1965. But man, that was a cool car. God, I loved it. And it was mine and I bought it before I had a license. So I bought it for $800 at a used car lot underneath, uh, the highway, and eventually I got a driver's license. And I think it made my roommate register it. I don't even know how I registered it without a driver's license, but I did. And I didn't drive it very much because I really had nowhere to go. I drove a little bit around Jersey City, and then I would take the PATH train to work and take the subway to work. I didn't drive to work, but you know, we would use it to drive to the supermarket or whatever. But mainly, I would wash and wax that car I learned to change the oil, I learned to change the plugs, I learned how to do all kinds of stuff that kind of people don't do anymore. But man, I love that car. I can still smell it. Oh. And then, after like 18 months, so, oh yes, so right as I was moving to Jersey City, literally a week before Jersey, I moved to Jersey City, mid-June 1986, I met my first, a woman who was to be my, my first wife, Patty. June 16th, 1986, I met her. And like a week later, I moved to Jersey City. And then, I don't know, at what point did I buy this car? I got my first dog and I got my first car out there. And Patty and I, Patty didn't know how, never got a license, I don't think. She never knew how to drive. But we would drive, we would just polish this car The fair lane. Okay, so then, eventually, I was getting ready to move. No, yeah, so I lived there not for that long. And I had a roommate, Simon. And one day, 
He came back from the supermarket in the Fairlane and it had a huge dent in the side. And this is a car that had very few miles. It was perfect. Now suddenly it had a massive dent in the side. <sighs> to me, that was a sign of the end. Once a car is messed up like that, then it starts to get, it attracts more and more dings and scratches, and soon it's just not a thing of beauty anymore. It's just an old car. He claimed that somebody had run into it with a shopping cart, which I think isn't true. I mean, this car was solid Detroit steel. There's no way that that happened. All right, my blood pressure is going up just thinking of the story. <laughs> anyway. I think I gave him the car. I was just like, you know what? I'm moving back to Manhattan. Just keep the car. Moved back to Manhattan. Didn't have a car for a while. But that thing kept bugging me. I was like, oh, I love that car. And then there was a guy in my neighborhood when I lived in Chelsea, and he had two amazing cars. And they were the same car, but they were different. And they, these cars were a type of car that's called... A Mercury Monterey, 18 feet long, and he owned two of them. And this guy, his name was Augie, and I saw this car parked on the street, and I left him a note, and I was like, man, this car is awesome. I need to know more about this car. It was kind of like the Fairlane, but way longer, way longer, slim and slender. This was like... Such a sexy car. And uh, it had, at the back, it had these long red brake lights. Oh, my God, you're not seeing what I'm drawing here. These long red brake lights that were cones, red cones like the space program. That's what it was inspired, this car. God, it was gorgeous. And, um, you know, it was, it was from the same kind of basic era as the Fairlane. But it was like the super sexy deluxe version of it. Um, so he owned two of these cars, and I bought one of them. It was blue on the bottom and white on the top, two-tone. God, that car is cool. Um, it had this line down the side, and then this other line that went back like that. Really, really sexy and gorgeous car. Um, I put it in a commercial once. This car was in movies. It was in, uh, oh no, it was Augie's other car that was in this movie that Robert De Niro directed in the period. It was beautiful. His car, Augie's version of this car, his was even more deluxe than mine. It had air conditioning and it had a thing called a breezeway. So you would push a button on the dashboard and the window at the back, this is the back window, not this side window, the back window would go down. And so I remember driving with him once, and we had like all this paper in it that I've been showing him. I forget what it was. It was I'd originally, I found this old manual from these cars. I was showing it to him, and uh, we opened the breezeway, and all the car windows, all the paper flew out the back window, which is probably the reason why most cars don't have breezeways. But man, that car was cool. Yeah, that was it, the Merc. The Merc, we called it. Four doors. That was a car I had when Jack was first born, and it was like, and and then um, I think we sold it. This is around the time that Patty had her accident, so it just became really impractical. She couldn't get into the car. There was all kinds of problems with it, so we ended up getting rid of it. Oh, sold it back to Augie. Yeah, because who else was going to buy this car? It was so big that you couldn't park it in an indoor garage because it was too long. Eighteen feet. It's beautiful. All right, so then, next car. So this was this was the bourgeoisification of my life, having a kid, a wife and a kid. You know, again, still living in Manhattan, Manhattan, Manhattan. But we eventually decided, you know, we need to buy a car again. People who live in Manhattan go through this, where you think you need a car because if you have a car. Then, like, you'll go places and you'll do stuff instead of renting cars. It's actually nonsense a lot of the time. It's just a really expensive thing to do. Owning a car in Manhattan is madness. 
There's an episode of The Odd Couple. Remember that show? Um, in which Felix wins uh, a car on a radio show. Wins a car. Or is it Oscar? I forget. And they spend all this time moving it around and parking it. Because that's what happens. The opposite side of the car park. Uh, the opposite side of the street parking. Or you get a, like I did, you get a uh, an indoor garage and it costs you so much money. I mean, now it's like over $1,000 a month. That's like what people pay for an apartment in normal places in the world. But no. Anyway, so we had this car. We decided, you know, we have to get a station wagon. And this is at a time in the mid-90s when there was only really one company that made station wagons. American comp- car companies didn't make station wagons anymore, really. So the only car, they, everybody made uh, minivans and SUVs. So the only one we could get was a Volvo station wagon. Kind of a classic. Had these big headrests. But that was it. Volvo station wagon. It was nice. It was the first new car I ever owned. But, you know, we, we had a, we leased it for like a year. Year and a half. And then it was like, this is ridiculous. It's way too expensive. So, went back to not having a car. Yeah, all right. We're almost out of time, so I'm going to... Yeah, I think I'll stop there. I'll stop there. There's a couple more cars, but that's enough. You get the idea. All right. I've stopped bleeding. And I'm going to stop drawing. Yeah. So, you know... It's interesting to think about your past in these terms. And it's interesting to me to use drawing as a trigger to focus and think about what you're doing, what you're experiencing, to allow your mind to wander, to try to remember details. Because I think as you're struggling to remember, what does this car look like? What did the back windows look like? What was the overall shape? As you're struggling to think about those things, you're tapping into memories that have been scabbed over that are deep inside your head and you haven't had access to them. But as you picture them, you go, what was it like to sit in the back seat? What did my dad's shoulder look like over the front seat? Uh, what was the radio, what did the radio look like? All those things, you know? You remember like fighting with your brother. You remember when you first learned to drive. You. Maybe you lost your virginity in the back of a car. That's kind of a cliche, but maybe you did. What kind of car was it? What was that like? Um, going to a drive-in. Did you have to look after the car? Have you ever popped the hood on your current car? I mean, as I said, like my Fairlane and the Merc, I learned to change, you know, to like, you know, fix the timing, all kinds of things I learned to do under the hood. Never after that. No, no, no. You would never deal with the inside of a car after that. Cars just in general now, they're all, they all look the same. I mean, nothing looks like, you know, even the VW Beetle, that kind of looks a bit different. But most cars now, they're white, they're silver, they're gray. They all look the same to me, you know. They've lost, they've lost that romance. They've lost that individuality. They're basically laptops on wheels now. And, uh, you know, I don't know. I hate, I hate to be, like, geezery and nostalgic about stuff that happened 50 years ago. It's gross. But what are you going to do? Jenny, thank you for playing. Jenny says, I've forgotten how many classic cars have played a part in my memories. My granddad's Morris Minor, my dad's Series 3 Land Rover. Yeah. Sarah just drew my cars. It doesn't matter. Okay, so Sarah, here's what I would say. Try it and just Google them. Go to Google Images now. Do this exercise again. Go back and look at photos of those cars. You know, and if you can't remember, if you go like, my dad had a Mercury and I guess I was seven, so just do that. Put in like the year roughly. You'll see. You'll figure it out. You'll remember. You'll remember. And draw it. Look at it. Study the picture. Then put it away. Then draw it. Use it to evoke memories. Don't, don't be leeching off my memories, girl. All right. Jenny can also smell the leather 
in her granddad's car. That leather smell, all these classic cars, you go in, you, as soon as you get into them, there's something about the smell. I think it's probably, frankly, uh, fumes leaking from the engine compartment. It's part of what it is, that old, old car smell. But it is a very, it is a very um, identifiable smell. Lenore says she's never been a car person. Yeah. You don't have to be a car person. Just go back and look at them. These are part of your life. I'm not a building person, and I, but I still can go back and draw the houses I lived in. So it, it was, it, these are things that were part of your life, you know? And it's important to, to trigger them, to cherish your memories, and to use your art to evoke them, to form connections. Because this kind of exercise, it, it, um, it unblocks you. It unblocks other memories, too. So it might be a memory that began with a car. What was it like on Sunday to drive to your grandmother's house in the car? What kind of car did she have? And then what was that feeling like of going to her house? Who else would be there? What would she serve? What kind of glasses did she serve you lemonade in? What kind of dog did she have? All these things make our lives not a blur. Now we take Instagram pictures, we constantly sh snapping pictures of everything with our phones. A lot of the stuff we don't have access to anymore, these old memories, you know? And I'm not just talking if you're 70 or 60, even if you're 30, you know? I mean, my son gets nostalgic about stuff and he's 26. We'll talk about, you know, he wants to go back to New York now to visit it because he wants to see whether the 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 deli from his that he remembers getting egg sandwiches in when he was a kid is still there, you know. So, all right, thank you all for joining me. Um, this was really fun. I think next week I'm not going to be here. I'm going to we're not going to draw with me next week. We'll be back after that. I think I'm going to take a week off. I've got a bunch of stuff to do. But I'd love to see what you've done in the meantime, and I'll share it with the rest of the crew. Uh, whoops. If you just show this, if you put this tag, hashtag SBS Draw with me, put it on Instagram, put it on Facebook, come to the schoolyard, put it in there, and that way I can gather it all together and we can look at it. Um, so, yeah, so that was fun. Those of you who are in Spark, I'll see you in, this, in the after session. We'll talk about this live together on Zoom. We can chat about our cars and our memories. We will be starting that in about 10 minutes. So I'll see you there. The rest of you, I'll see you next in two weeks. Have a great, uh, I hope, oh, by the way, I never even mentioned the snow and the horrors of the weather right now. I hope that you're okay. And I hope that, well, if you have enough electricity to watch this, you're doing reasonably well. Some people are doing worse. That's terrible. It's been a, it can't be a rough year again. No, God, please, no. Anyway. Thank you. Thanks for joining me and thank